Uh, now, unfortunately, there's actually a bunch of right-hand rules, and so students often get confused because they'll see a different right-hand rule used in lecture than in their discussion section, and a new right-hand rule used in, um, in the textbook, and then maybe a new right-hand rule used by their tutor. Well, uh, I'm going to try to use the right-hand rules that I find students make the least mistakes with, but you might see other people using different right-hand rules. Um, when you're doing a right-hand rule, there's some right-hand rules that have you curling your fingers. And there's other right-hand rules that have you keeping your fingers straight. Mm -hmm. um, I've tried to teach people the curling fingers method, and they never, everyone always seems to have trouble with that. So we're going to deal with right-hand rules with straight fingers. Okay. I'm only going to deal with um, straight fingers. All right, so um, let's go through this. Now, it turns out that we care, this here stands for the velocity of the moving charge. I'll put it at zero here because this is the test charge. But we only care about the component of the velocity that is perpendicular to the magnetic field. I think sometimes we've used this little symbol in the past to show the component of one vector that's perpendicular to another vector. This is the component of the velocity that's perpendicular to the magnetic field. For example, suppose that this was the velocity. Well, this would be v perpendicular the component of the velocity that's perpendicular to the magnetic field. And this is the only component that we care about. We're going to ignore the parallel, the component that's parallel. Do you see why I said this is pointing up? The overall vector is pointing right and up, so its component should be pointing up. Okay, so we focus on the component that's perpendicular to B. Uh, let's think about a couple of special cases. Let's say this is the magnetic field and this is the velocity. This is the velocity of the, of the test charge. What would V perpendicular be in this case? Um, you mean V perpendicular to, to B? To B. In, in, uh, in this context, V perpendicular always stands for the component of the velocity that is perpendicular to the magnetic field. So what would V perpendicular be here? Let's actually talk about that a little. This um, vector is parallel to right. B, which means it doesn't have a component that's oh, perpendicular okay. to B. Oh, right. So what would a mathematician say is V perpendicular? Zero. Yeah, they got to give it a number, so they would give it zero. Yeah, okay. okay, all right. So if the velocity is parallel to B, V perpendicular would be zero. What would V perpendicular be in this case? When you're ready, take your time. Okay. Um, in that case, it would also be zero. Because here V is anti-parallel. And again, it doesn't have a component that's perpendicular. You can't try, usually we break things into components by, broad, by drawing a right triangle. But there isn't really any right triangle that you can draw here. So V perpendicular here would also be zero. And what can we say about V perpendicular in this case? Um, it's, it is equal to V? Yeah, that's right. Didn't sound too happy about that, but that's exactly right. Yeah. In this case, the overall vector is already perpendicular to V, so there's no need to break out a component that's perpendicular to V because it's already perpendicular. So if the velocity is perpendicular to the magnetic field, then the component that's perpendicular is just that velocity itself. What would V parallel be here? Um, v. This is the component of the velocity that's parallel to V. Um, what would V parallel be in this case? It would be V perpendicular. I don't know what the component of V that's perpendicular to V. I'm not sure. But that doesn't quite make sense, right? No, I um, B. Because this is perpendicular B. to B, it doesn't have a component that's oh. parallel to B. Okay. So what number would we give this? Zero? Yeah. All right, sometimes it seems like the case when something is zero is the trickiest case. Mm -hmm. If V is parallel to B, 
then it doesn't have a component that's perpendicular to b. So we could say mathematically that that component is zero. Well, if b is perpendicular to b, then it doesn't have a component that's parallel to b. So we could say this component is zero. We don't really care about b parallel, but just as an exercise, it was important to see here that the entire vector represents the perpendicular component. So none of this represents the parallel component. How about in this case? What would v parallel be in this case? Uh, equal to v. Yeah, in this case, the entire velocity just represents the parallel component, and the perpendicular component is zero. All right, now to tell the truth, in the great majority of problems that you see, the great majority, uh, oh, in the, in the final case is this case, where v is neither parallel nor perpendicular. Only in this case would both v parallel and v perpendicular have be non-zero. And this is the only case where you actually have to laboriously break this into components. Um, now, truth to tell, because this is an introductory class, the vast majority of the problems that you're going to see are going to be like this, or like this. Okay. Um, it's actually going to be pretty rare that you actually have to break V into components, but it's still worth, uh, in fact, you probably won't see this at all on the exam. Okay. However, there is a good chance you'll see a couple questions like this on the homework. So it's good to talk about this because you'll need it for the homework. Okay. But on the exam, you're almost always going to be in a position where V is already perpendicular to B, or where it's parallel to B and doesn't have a perpendicular component. So in most cases, we'll be doing this, and we'll just put in v itself for v perpendicular. Now notice that uh, here, your fingertips point in the direction of q times v. That means we're multiplying v times q. Now what really matters here is just whether q is positive or negative. For example, if q is positive, then qv would be in the same direction as v. But if q is negative, then qv would be opposite to the direction of v. You saw last term that when you multiply a vector by a positive number, it keeps the same direction. But when you multiply it by a negative number, it reverses direction. All right, so we're finally ready to try a problem. We have a positive 5 Coulomb charge. This is its velocity vector. It's moving in a magnetic field that looks like this. And we want to figure out the magnetic force on this charge. So we'll work through this together. Let me have a copy down. All right. Now, before we can do anything, we have to figure out what this is going to be. Well, first of all, what can you tell me about V perpendicular here? What does V perpendicular stand for? Oh, it perpendicular stands for the component of V that's perpendicular to B. Is equal to v. Yeah. Well, this is already perpendicular to yeah. B. So I'm going to rewrite that like this. This is V perpendicular. But now we need Q naught times V perpendicular. Well, this is pointing to the right. So should this be pointing to the right or left? Because this is a positive charge. Yeah. By the way, are we treating this like a test charge or a source charge? Um, well, it looks like a test charge. Though. Because we're asking about the force on it. That's how we know this is a test charge, because we're looking for the force on it. Okay. Um, I haven't even told you what the source charge is of this magnetic field. In a lot of problems, you'll just be told there's an external magnetic field, and we're not even, even being told where this is coming from. So we're just working with this part of the flow chart and not with this part. We're assuming there's an magnet, external magnetic field, but we don't know where it's coming from. All right, now we're ready to use the right hand rule. Now, first of all, um, in your, in your uh, hand, um, who's your fingertips? Well, this is your fingertips. This is what I mean by your fingertips. Not this over here. This is what I would call your finger pads. Well, we're not using your finger pads. We're using your fingertips. Okay. And again, we're not going to curl our hand. So which way should I point my fingertips now? Left, right, up or down, in or out? using this right hand rule. To the right. Because we figured out that this is to the right. Mm -hmm. All right, so I got my hand pointing to the right. Um, all right, and you can give this a shot too. Um, right here. Uh, from my perspective, it's pointing to the right. Okay. Maybe not from here, so maybe uh, I have to do it from your perspective. Huh? <laughs> um, uh, now I'm getting confused. Okay. Uh, all right, well, uh, let's see. So, um, oh, well, I should make it point, be pointing like that, mm -hmm. so to follow the on the board. So now this is pointing to the right. Okay, now which way should my palm be pointing? Um, 
because that points in the direction of the magnetic field. So I'm going to rotate until my palm is up. Now, make sure that we haven't messed up our fingers. Are our fingers still pointing to the right? Yes. All right. And then, what does that tell us about the direction of the magnetic force? It's perpendicular to B. So what direction would that be? Left, right, up or down, in or out of the board? Um, it's coming out of the board. Because my thumb here is pointing away from the board. Yeah. The thumb represents the magnetic force. Well, that here is pointing away from the board. I see. And what would be the symbol for that? Um, the dot. Yeah, that's like the tip of the arrow. So all that work was to generate this one little dot. Okay. That's the answer to the question. We figured out that the direction of the magnetic force here is coming out of the board. All right, so this is a good right-hand rule to use when you're trying to figure out the magnetic force. Notice what this means is if we know any two of these things, we can figure out the third. 